All right. Thanks, everybody, so much for joining us today for another Road to the 2016 Candy Awards webinar series. We're very happy that you are attending today. Uh, today's theme or topic is all about the power of consistent candidate communications. Now, the good news is uh, we're still definitely doing this webinar today. The bad news is, is that my uh, wonderful guest unfortunately had an emergency and cannot make it today. But oh, don't move, don't leave. I've got some exciting content for you. I'm actually going to do a related presentation all around candidate communications with a few examples from uh, past and current candidate experience award winners. And I'm going to actually show you that list in just a minute because just this morning, on November 1st, we did announce the, the 50 North American Candidate Experience Award winners in 2016. So I'm going to share that with you next. So don't go anywhere. Lots of great content. And let's talk about the Talent Board for a second. For those that don't know, Talent Board is a nonprofit research organization all about elevating and promoting a quality candidate experience. We were founded in 2011, and we continue to expand globally, as you can see by this map. In North America, which this year's survey is closed, obviously, since we did announce the winners this morning, uh, we had uh, over 240 companies participate, 180,000 candidate responses, and 50 winners. And again, winners, for those that don't know how we do this process uh, as a research organization, they're solely based on the candidate ratings themselves of their experience going applying for jobs at these companies that I'm going to show you in a second. So again, it's the top 50 benchmark companies that have the highest candidate ratings based on our data analysis and the survey research that we do. We're still open in EMEA and APAC. Those, those um, are still open through November, and then they'll close and we'll start doing those analyses as well. So thanks again for joining us. I'm very happy to announce, and you're all getting it right here that are joining me today, the 2016 North American Candidate Experience Awards winners and all 50 companies. Uh, we have lots of returning uh, benchmark companies as well as new ones, which we're very excited. Lots of great brands there, uh, companies big and small in throughout North America. And of course, they're global companies too. But right now, we're just celebrating the North America uh, benchmark companies for this year's research. So that said, I also want to thank all of our underwriters um, and all of our Global Platinum Gold and Silver sponsors for the Talent Board and Candidate Experience Awards. We couldn't do it without you all. Thanks again for your generous ongoing support. And we look forward to celebrating in a couple of weeks in Austin, Texas at the Recruiting Trends and Talent Acquisition Technology Conference and the uh, North America Awards Gala, all cel being celebrated and attended November 14th through 16th in Austin, Texas. So, quick comics for you, some funnies, right? I mean, for all of us that are on this call right now, we, that are in talent acquisition, that are in the hiring business, uh, in recruiting and HR and, and er, anything related therein, um, we got a lot, there's a lot of funny things that we come across all the time, whether it's something that we do that we have to be self-deprecating about or the candidates themselves when they're applying for jobs at our organization. I'm sure you've seen lots of funnies like this as well. But what I want, do want to do is, is kind of, talk about a few companies um, uh, and also kind of highlight some great candidate experience awards and talent board research data that highlights the power of communications. Capital One has been a, a multi-year winner uh, for, for at least five of the six years. And one of the things that they've done quite dramatically uh, as in their organizations is really transform how they manage recruiting. And, and you know, first and foremost, basically making the decision that the candidate is the primary customer for recruiting and, and being a consumer-based business, it does totally affect what they do as an organization as well. They do lots of great things. I'm not going to read all these bullets for you, but the one I wanted to highlight is the fact that they encourage um, and, and, and almost mandate regular candidate communications and feedback throughout the process from even pre-application all the way to onboarding and beyond. They do lots of great things, and I'm emphasizing this because this is a theme that occurs again and again in many of the organizations that have had the highest candidate experience ratings via our research program, that they are doing this again and again, and that's really d differentiating them from most of the other organizations uh, around the world for that matter. So let's talk about uh, just a, a couple of aspects of recruiting, application, and interview disposition, and then kind of the impact of candidate experience. That's what I want to round out for you in this today's short session and, and focusing on 
communication as a big theme. So when we look globally at this year's data, um, I know we're still collecting data in a me and APAC, but these are, this is a great way to kind of get a snapshot. And these are things that have been trending over the past few years globally as well, as well as in North America in particular. But here's the, there's the thing. Communicating at the stage, there's a lot of automation that goes on. Everybody on this call knows that. You may have a lot of autoresponders that are kicking out when those that don't make the grade when, they're, when they've applied or notifying them that they're going to be moving on to the next screening process, take this assessment, whatever that case is. That's, I wouldn't say easy for organizations, but it's there because everybody has a lot of platforms in place, whether it be ATS and or CRM to be able to do regular automated communications. What's harder is actually asking for and giving feedback, especially at the application stage, but this is a differentiator for many organizations more and more. So when you look at this data that I'm sharing with you right now, when we ask the candidates, were you asked for feedback about when you went through the application process? Believe it or not, more companies are doing this now, and it is making a difference in the, not only the, 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 the conversion of getting app, applications to, to actually complete the whole process, but also to be able to have a better quality of candidate because of the fact that there's some, uh, there's some feedback offered at this stage. When we correlate that with the one in five star experience that we asked them about, one being the lowest experience, though not so great, and five being the, the best experience or the best on a one to five point Likert scale. When we correlate those, you can see that those companies globally that are actually um, asking for feedback about the recruiting process and, and even invited to share their impressions about it be even before they applied, there are companies that are doing that and those are the ones that are getting those five star ratings overall because this is one of many things that they're doing that make a difference in their recruiting process. Those that aren't at all, that were never asked or don't ask their candidates and their candidates are saying overall, I'm having a crummy time going through this process. That's a huge missed opportunity for organizations today. And as we're talking about moving, you know, moving the dial incrementally just a couple of ticks in order to begin to bring that number down and increase the green on this slide. So that's a big difference. And here's another one that just that always blows me away that every time I look at it, when we look at it globally, um, how long individuals are, were still waiting at the time they completed the survey to hear back from a company after they applied, all right? Look at this, look at the volume of these individuals. I mean, over 75% was two months, over two months, or over three months that they still had not heard back from the company after they applied. I mean, that, to me, again, huge missed opportunity. Bringing that number down is a great opportunity to improve potentially the quality of the candidate, but also to reduce the amount of candidate resentment that can impact referral networks that you, won't, you may not get because of this stuff that's happening, all right? So this is for all, um, again, comparing all three regions, knowing that EMEA and APAC is still collecting, but it's pretty, pretty clear that this is a trend that's you know, not, not great, can be totally improved on. AT&T is a company, another winner this year, just as Capital One, as I shared with you, um, that is a, yet again a Candidate Experience Award benchmark winner based on their candidate ratings. They, they've gone, they have done a lot of work in making a difference in their communications that they give, not only at the interview and offer stage, but even before that too, even all the way to the research stage when they're doing a lot of social media work. The hashtag life at AT&T, for example, is, is something that they use quite readily across social channels, Twitter in particular, but and, and leverage that are communicating regularly with candidates even before they apply. Um, they have a, lot, a big need for field technicians as well, and this is one area that they've improved dramatically on reducing the time to not only um, for reducing the application itself, the length of it, but getting them to apply uh, uh, more regularly and convert those applications based on the work that they're doing, again, with their communications from pre-application all the way through onboarding. So that's another a, a quick example for you of a company that's doing a lot of work there. A lot of these things that I'm sharing with you, we're gonna, I, I'm excited because we'll continue to have a whole new set of case studies from that list of the winners from this year. Again, some new, some, many returning that will begin to, to, to release into the wild this next year through workshops and webinars and other research articles beyond the research report that we do every year which will be released right after the holidays uh, in 2017, based on this year's data in North America. Uh, we do separate reports for the regions too. Anyway, lots more case studies coming, which we're very excited about. So here's some things that overall that candy winners are doing better on the application stage. Um, obviously making it easy and providing status updates. More and more companies are doing this today, like where am I at in the process? How long is it gonna take? What, am I, what should my expectations be? 
acknowledging their skills and experience in various different ways, whether it be automated or a, a reply back from the organization. But the communicate often is a huge differentiator, continues to be so. And that's just something I, want, I really wanted to drive home on this point. Let's go to interviewing now. Because at another critical time and really a time where there should be much more hands-on with all of your, your finalists, right? There's, it's not at this stage, I guess I'll say it this way, there's really no excuse not to, oh, to prepare and communicate with your finalists that you're bringing in for interviews, whether they be done virtually or on, or on site and, and in person. So when you look at this slide, there's a lot going on here, but let me just explain it to you. Again, we're looking at global data from this year. Um, correlating between the one horrible experience, five-star experience, and the, and the five-star great experience, so the one-star to five-star range. And when you look at all the things that your organizations are doing today before the interview occurs, so the prep and communication with the candidates before, lots of, com lots of candidates that are getting five-star experiences, they're getting all this stuff, right? They're getting the background of those that are gonna, they're going to interview with beforehand. They're getting agendas beforehand. They're getting um, really hands-on concierge service when they're on site for interviews, depending on the level of position. Their travel is coordinated, again, depending on the level of, 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 um, uh, of position. And they're provided you know, a follow-up process after the fact. All these things that these five-star experience candidates are getting. On the other side, when you look at those that are really having not a great time overall through the process, they're getting none of these things. None. A huge missed opportunity again with 61% of those candidates that are saying they're not getting any of these things or overall are having a one star. This is something that can definitely be improved on that you have you should have the team and resources in play to be able to, do, to better communicate and prepare your candidates ahead of time. Quick question, quick little anecdote about Capital One just because it's still in my memory. I, I presented with who's now the um, chief people officer of Capital One Canada recently at HR Tech, she gave a case study presentation that was great about what they've done because she was a big part of transforming their recruiting and that slide that I showed you earlier. One story that she shared was because they empower their recruiters to do whatever it takes, right? So there was, there was a candidate that was coming in on the train, um, their luggage didn't show up, he, had, he didn't have his, his nice interview suit for the next day. Um, he was against, this was for a high, high level business analyst position, lots of really smart folks from Google and other companies competing against. Um, and so the recruiter, without even asking for permission, went out and bought a reasonably priced suit for this candidate because she knew she wanted to close him and wanted him to be the one that got hired. He was very, very grateful. He went through the interview process. Months later, he ends up, he, he accepts the offer and gets the job and acknowledges the fact that Capital One went above and beyond. And the good news is, is that the recruiter did get reimbursed for that suit, <laughs> which I'm sure everybody has a question about. And again, do they do that all the time? I, no, I don't think there's a high level of frequency of that, but it's, they were empowered enough to do whatever it took, communication and taking action um, to ensure that they have the right talent. It's that competitive of a marketplace out there today. All right, let me keep moving on. Feedback again. So one is about, what you know prep and communication now we're talking about missed opportunities globally with candidates when it comes to um, again asking about feedback and giving feedback during the interview process right those that are having a five-star experience um, again are, are definitely have an edge when it comes to getting some information back impressions about the interview before the next steps and all that good stuff but a huge number of those with a one-star experience again over 84 percent um, aren't, we're, we're never asked for any feedback at all about the process. So again, another missed opportunity here that can make a difference, even a few percentage points of keeping the experience more palatable for them, even especially since nine out of 10 people that you're looking at aren't gonna get the job in the first place. So again, that's something I wanted to emphasize. Let me keep going now because we've got a great another example of from Comcast, who's yet again another, um, they're a multi-year winner, and again a winner this year, based on their candidate ratings. They, they have developed quite an, a, 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 an effective concierge service when it comes to the interview stage for those individuals that they're bringing in, that just ensuring that every single aspect pre, during, and post interview um, is handled with the as utmost care as they possibly can. 
and ensuring that those silver medalists and those that were other finalists that don't get the job are, are also followed up with on, on a regular and kept in touch with as well beyond. So something else that they do quite well and effective and another example I wanted to share with you. Uh, let me keep moving on because I want to get to the, what I like to call the money shot here. So one of the things that, again, overall candidate award winning companies are doing better is they're preparing candidates again before the interview. They're asking, always asking relevant questions and providing feedback as well as giving it too. I mean, asking for it. So that's one of the things that is some big differentiators here again at the interview stage. Let's talk about screening and dispositioning now because this is a tough one, right? This is when you're actually telling the candidates that the road has ended for you, right? There's, there, we're not going to hire you. Thanks again for everything. So here's another missed opportunity when, when, the, when we ask the candidates about when the recruiting process ended for them, okay? Where, whenever that was, what happened? And for those that are having a globally a five-star experience, they're getting more hands-on touch. Now, likely, which I'm sure that you could read into the data here, that's at the later stages of the process that those are individuals maybe in the late screening and interview process that are getting more hands-on. But again, they are getting it. They're getting that, that, that hands-on experience, hands-on um, communication is what I mean, from not only an email, but also phone calls from higher managers and recruiters, and um, much more so than those that have a horrible overall one-star experience. And again, there's a missed opportunity. Yes, there's auto messages that go out, right? And so you can see in that do not reply section, those with the one star over 60% are, are usually getting that, but a much lesser volume of those with five star are getting that. They're still getting it. You're still going to be sending those out. Those, some of you, by the very, very nature of the sheer volume of candidates that you're getting every month, you cannot, but you cannot, but you have to automate, right? I get that. We all get that. But again, there's a difference here between kind of the, as much hands-on that you can potentially give with the, with the team and the resources and the technology you have in place is really important. For, even especially when they're not selected, that's when the most, the heaviest negative sentiment is there because everybody thinks they're, they're the best qualified for the job. And they, when they don't get it, we're not happy about it, right? So, and then lastly, on the feedback side for, again, screening and dispositioning, Again, looking at the global data this year, comparing one star to five star experiences, that those that overall are having a much better experience, they're actually getting feedback and getting encouraged to apply for other jobs, according to our data, again, and what we ask. Um, and on the other end of that, there's no feedback at all for those, again, a huge percentage, over 73% of those with a one star experience. And we're talking about, again, um, relatively speaking, upwards of tens of thousands of apps of candidates at a time, depending on the, the, the research data that I'm pulling here, but still a huge volume of individuals, uh, tons that are not getting any feedback at all compared to um, those with getting the five-star experience. So again, something else I just wanted to really drive home with you all. So things that, are, that again, candy winners overall are doing better, and that is they're following up with candidates no matter what. There's two things that, can, that we all want as a job seeker, and you've all been there, we want acknowledgement that I'm interested in your organization and I want closure when I, whether I'm getting, whether I'm moving along or I'm not getting it, not getting the job. Um, always be clear and try to explain decisions, what I like to call specifically ambiguous, because I understand there's certain things you can't share and you don't want to share back for fear of legal um, potential problems. But still be clear about as much as you can, ask questions and not only give feedback, but ask them for feedback as well. Um, at, as many, at many different stages as you can, um, but particularly in the, you know, the early screening, later screening interview stages when you're dispositioning them. And now let's talk, I'm going to round this all out. Everything that I've outlined today, everything that we as the talent board talk about year round, about the impact of candidate experience, um, it is real. It is, it is uh, quite uh, readily can impact for good or ill will your organization revenue or full networks. And that's what I'm going to talk about the last few minutes. So it, this is, I love this picture. I put only because it's like, have you ever left somebody, you know, sitting at uh, the interview waiting for their time and they're just kind of waiting. I did this, I've done this as a hiring manager and it's, it's just, it's, it's unacceptable no matter what your schedule is like and what has happened. 20 minutes, after the inter my interview was supposed to start, I had a whole schedule of interviews. This is a few years ago now. 20 minutes, the front desk calls me and says, hey, your interview is waiting. 
uh, oh my gosh, threw the whole schedule of the day in a whack. I had other team members that needed to be in the interviews, had to adjust. And no matter how apologetic I was, this is stuff that we remember as a job seeker, right? As a candidate that we take away. So um, we, do, we do our best not to do that because that can impact. So candidates are sharing their positive and negative experiences um, in their, in, within their inner circle. This is the last three years in North America, actually, as a quick example. And the inner circle means friends, family, peers, colleagues, individuals that are close to us, right? So over 80% are sharing their positive experiences. That's great. That's what you want. Those are the referrals, potential referrals, and, and revenue as well if you're a consumer-based business. But the other side, two-thirds are sharing their negative experiences, then that's not what you want because that can eventually impact your revenue as well as referrals, which does impact revenue eventually because if you don't have those individuals in the seats because you didn't get the referrals that you needed, um, since a high percentage of, of hires still do come from referrals, again, it's all kind of interconnected, right? And we look at globally, almost the same picture, uh, positive experiences with inner circle, pretty high. Again, a nice two-thirds chunk of those globally um, will share negative with their inner circles. Then it gets, it, it actually is not as bad as you'd think, <coughs> excuse me, with the social media side. But it's still impactful. So 50% or more about, about thereabouts in North America will share their positive experiences online. Glassdoor, LinkedIn, their own blogs, Facebook, Twitter, just a variety of places, right? They're willing, they'll, they'll share that. They tell us that they will, or they have. A third won't do it. I mean, excuse me, a third will do it, share their negative experiences, and that's, that's, that's a huge impact. Why is that not higher? Another 40% on the negative side told us that this, this experience is private and they don't share it. And then and on the other side, on the positive side, 30 more percent in that same pool said, we don't share either because it's private. But the point is that there's still a significant number of individuals that are willing to do that. And whether they're ranting or just sharing, that can be impacted your brand and, and um, eventually referral networks and revenue. It's almost the same landscape globally this year when you look at compared positive and negative experiences. Huge impact. Now, here, the last thing I'm going to share with you, which, again, trying to round out that, not, that why, how important communication is across the board um, from pre-application to onboarding and everything you do in recruiting, for that matter. We ask the candidates how likely they're going to change their relationship status based on their overall candidate experience rating. So those who rate a five-star experience overall tell us that they are more willing to increase that relationship with that organization. That means buy stuff. That means refer people. That means apply again. It means talk well of publicly and even privately about that brand. That's great. That's what you want. The other end of that is the at an upward trend, unfortunately, that 43% of individuals this year in North America um, say that they will actually walk away from that relationship. They won't buy stuff, they won't refer people, and they won't apply again. All of the above, right? That's a huge, even if a fraction of those individuals put their money where their mouth is, that's significant impact potentially, potentially, to your revenue, to your referral, nexus, referral networks, which again translates into revenue. This is the same picture globally, almost the same thing. A little bit of a difference, but still quite impactful from positive to negative five to one star experience correlation it can potentially be of impact to your business. And then if you look at, I mean, overall, the last six years of us doing this research, when we look at it globally um, and, and accumulatively, and, uh, when we aggregate all the years, the one star experience candidates, 41% of them say that they'll take their relationship elsewhere. And 64% of a five-star says they'll increase. So those numbers still jive across the board this year and over the past six. It's a, it could potentially, again, that we can definitively measure the potential of business impact. And there are organizations, and we had over 400 companies globally this year that participated in our research. And we're working with a lot, a lot of companies into the next year and beyond to start quantifying what that potential cost and what that potential revenue increase could be. For an, for an organization based on whether or not you're a consumer-based business and or what, how do you quantify referral networks. And, and so we're doing a lot of great work that will start coming out next week, year on with some other case study information. Um, so that is what I wanted to share with you all today. These are some things that, we, again, we recommend that you can do. There's, there's different ways to start projecting this data, and we're trying to 
to be on the forefront of that as we move into 2017 to understand and quantify what that potentially can translate to. So that said, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this session up. I do appreciate you uh, for those that, that have come on today. Um, this has been recorded. We will archive it. You will get a copy of it so that you can watch it again if you came on late or you didn't attend. And if you have questions, please email me directly. Um, we're not going to take them in, th in this particular session, but email me and I'll be happy to answer them for you. And again, um, my apologies to my guest again, who I'm I, I, my, actually my sadness that she couldn't join us today uh, due to a personal emergency. But I hope that you enjoyed what I shared. And thanks again for joining, folks. We'll talk to you soon. Okay.